Welcome to Getting to the Truth in This Art. I am your host, Rob Lee. And today, I am interviewing the founder of Assista Sci-Fi, Isis Asari. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's super good to be here, Rob. <laughs> um, thank you for the energy. You're starting off. We're matching energy right now. So that's that's great. A transference um, from one coast to the other. And you're recording or you're, you're speaking live from the West Coast. And I believe you might be the furthest away person that we've, we've had on this podcast. So that's, that's a first, your first. Hey, I love you. <laughs> I, love, I mean, yeah. So that's awesome. Um, and it makes sense. Um, I think with Afro features and then science fiction, we have like, oddly enough, like a really strong base, um, on the East coast. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And I love, I love DC Baltimore. I know y'all consider yourselves very different. Um, but yeah. The, them's is fighting words, you know. <laughs> yeah, you're like, don't uh, do that. Okay, okay, learn. I'll, I'll, yeah. No, no, you're good. The, the worst thing to say probably is, yeah. So over there and be more. It's like, uh, <laughs> use the full word. Um. So, <laughs> if you will, give us those vital stats. Like, what's your background and, and what compelled you to start us to sci-fi? Yeah. So, um, ooh, what's my background? So I identify as a queer first generation Ghanaian American. Um, I am currently in Oakland, California, but I was born in Harlem. Um, so yeah, I still have a lot of love and affinity for Harlem and New York. Um, what, and, and then in terms of career, like, so I went to college, I went to grad school, I worked in corporate America and I was working in corporate America when I started Sister Sci-Fi. Um, and really it started because I was reading it. Um, I read Lilith Sprood. And I had, I was like, I wanted to talk to somebody about it. So I talked to a friend about it. And then like at the end of this discussion, we're like, what are we going to read next? And um, she started listing like N.K. Jemison and Nettie. No, it was like Nettie Corfor and Tommy Ayodemi. And at the time I didn't know either. And I felt like I missed two memos. One, Black women writing science fiction. And both of them were West African. And I was like, wait. <laughs> I, I like, I, I should have got a note. I, like somebody should have told me over oh, off or something like that. And I was like, I don't want anybody else to miss this memo. And they're like e-commerce. So I was like, this, you know, this could be cool. So my idea was like, oh, it'll be well-read black girl, but sci-fi. Mm -hmm. um, and then it kind of morphed and became like um, the first black owned bookstore focused on science fiction and fantasy. That's that's great. And I, I think I'd have another question. I don't want to bury the lead about that. So I think we're going to dive back in that a little bit later because I have an observation about that. But in it, in the the um, I guess the bio for the site, it says um, the sister sci fi is a cauldron of all things Afrofuturism. So if you will, because you're you'll be the third person that's attempted and the first two have said, no, nah, I can't explain that. Could you define or how, what is your definition of Afro Afrofuturism? Yeah. Um, I love that question. And I always caveat it with, this is my definition of Afrofuturism. If you want the official definition, you can go to Webster's Dictionary. Um, so for me, Afrofuturism really is a marriage of taking cultural aspects of um, the African diaspora. So if it's West African or African-American or um Afro-British or Caribbean culture and really in a very intentional way, infusing it with technology and having characters that are empowered in the near or far future. Sure. Um, and so for me, all those three things have to be present. You have to have like grounded um, an intentional connection to uh, like diaspora culture. So having a, a, a science fiction book set in the future and the characters black and passing doesn't count. Um, you have to have an aspect of, of technology and, and to link that technology to the culture. So one of my favorite is like um, ne um, Nayla Hopkinson's Midnight Robber. Mm -hmm. And like, she has things like the Nancy net, which ties back to like the Nancy fables and so forth. And she makes that like an omnipresent technology, which does everything from like unlock your front door to track where you're going at night to all those kind of things. Um, so that's kind of the technology. And then also that last part in part in the future, right? So 
sometimes you have uh, science fiction and fantasy where like you have people of color in the future and they're still traumatized and oppressed. Um, and that's not a lot of fun. So for me, a key part of Afrofuturism is that it's in the future and we're empowered and, and we're smart and we're mastering um, destiny. So those are the three things I look for when I put something in the realm of Afrofuturism. And that is the world according to ISIS is sorry. So. <laughs> I feel like that's a whole series is like the world accorded according to ISIS is sorry. Here's my thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that that's a word that's thrown around because it has it, it. I don't think there's one, obviously one set definition, but I think it, I think I think the way that you explained it is really is like there are certain key elements. And I think that has to be someone that says, look, this has to be in there. It's like not saying that you can't extend, but this has to be in there. You'll see things that have elements of it, like the way you were describing it. I, I agree with that definition too, being a person that has watched different things that try to do it. And it's like, nah, that doesn't quite work. That's more sci-fi. Oh, you're black, but also right. Um, like if it was a little bit further in the future and they, do, they, they state what it is and that's the kind of the issue, but some of the stuff that they did in like black Panther, it's like, okay, you have that technology element. Obviously they're in a fake country that's in, you know, maybe uh, Wakanda is where I don't know, but uh, so that exists, but it kind of set it into the, the kind of present contemporary times, but the technology is, you know, it's fantasy in that element in that way. So it's like, there's an attempt there. You you see these different convergences. You see things that look traditional of your know, various like African cultures that are making up that. And then you see technology that does not exist today. And it's like, OK, there's an attempt there. And that's in the direction. So when someone throws that out there, it's not because you, you know, might wear weird jewelry or something. It's just like, that's cool. But it's not from future. But so I, I like the way that you divide it. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I I want to talk about I want to talk about fandoms, right? Um, mm. I've gone on paper <laughs> complaining about fans. Um, not in a I I think certain things that we like we're very protective of, right? <laughs> and sometimes we will give them a pass. And I would imagine you being a person of color like me, a black person as well, that. You look at things you're like, oh, this was not a good, I like this, but also this is in there too. And this sucks actually. Um, and especially if you encounter the things as, as a kid, right? So like when people talk, talk to me about, let's say Ghostbusters for sake of argument, I always mm -hmm. talk about Ghostbusters too, because to me, that's the black one. I was like, yo, Bobby Brown is in it. And this soundtrack is like super black. And I was like, but then he also had that weird corny, yeah, man, I want to get one of them proton packs for my brother. And I was like, okay, that's, that's a little coonish. But fine. Um, so in what ways or, or, or what ways have early literary or pop culture experiences and personal history kind of led you to maybe crafting how you are, you're, you're working with Sister Sci-Fi? Um, wow. So I'm processing that question. Um, that was a lot there, I know. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh. um, so I think a response to fandom, I think one thing that came up for me is I consider myself a professional fangirl. Um, cause <laughs> love it. Um, and also, and, and when I say that, I mean that like, I think there's a special place in heaven for black creatives, right? Mm -hmm. Um, especially black creatives that are doing it for the culture, um, as hackneyed and cheesy as that means, because like there are, <laughs> there are a lot of other ways to move in the world. Right. Um, and it's not always easy to like, develop and maintain that authentic voice right sure yeah. um so i mean like anything i can do to grow up a black creative within um my limited bandwidth i'm here for it um in terms of things that kind of like influenced me and i think so much comes into my head i'm like ah, where do we start from? right um so and i guess since i run a book so i guess i should start with literature so um <laughs> <laughs> so I was really excited about like diff like all the different literature movements, particularly um, the literature that came out of the, like the Harlem Renaissance, right? And that writing and that kind of like writing of how how do we think about like the new Negro and defining blackness and like that opportunity and so forth. Um, and I loved writing like in terms of 
when I was growing up, contemporary stuff like Alice Walker um, and Toni Morrison and rewriting and rethinking about the Black experience, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And particularly Alice Walker, like going back and like almost like rediscovering Zernell Hurston for like a new generation. Um, And so when I think about how those two women writers kind of influenced me, I think they gave me the power to move differently Right. Um, And not everything has to be like this very heteronormative way of operating in the world. Um, And then also to pay homage to like the culture references that came before us. Right. From all over the diaspora. Um, So I don't know if that answers my your question. No, no, no. (laughs) that's what came up for me. (laughs) No, I mean, I think you think it's applicable to what one's fandom is. So like like one of my fandoms and obviously in, in doing a podcast I, I remember I, I, I'll put it this way. I got to give you this context. I'm a six foot four, 300 pound black man with a beard. So you got that right. And I can be verbally aggressive sometimes because I'm very, I'm very quick with what I say sometimes. So I'll leave that where it's at. So I'm the things that I like, I'm not a jerk about it, but I come with a certain slant, especially with things that I'm very passionate about, such as podcasting. So if someone comes to me about podcasting, I'll make a point. I was like, when you think of a podcaster, do you think of someone who looks like me or some white dude with a beard? Mm. It's like, it's, it's probably that. And I was like, that gives me that, that notion of my fandom is as a person who enjoys podcasts, I'm not seeing someone that represents my take and my angle more often than not. So in some ways in the back of my head, maybe I feel like it's my duty to kind of show out and show that I'm really good at this and kind of help amplify people who look like me. It's like, okay, yeah, this is how you can do this better. I, I, you know, having that amount of experience because I was like some white dude with a neck beard is going to tell you that you're not good at it or your opinions don't matter when it comes to especially like something like 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 fandom or pop culture or anything in the realm of what sister sci fi is talking about those those areas. And that's that's the thing that gets me like I remember this is not in the same, but I remember a a radio show host that I was a big fan of. And um, he's been outed for kind of kind of being a scumbag a little bit, um, which is great because screw him. But I, I remember when the uh, the most recent Spider-Man, like the Tom Holland Spider-Man came out. And this was uh, when he first appeared in what, Civil War. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, man, the mask looks really cool and all of this. And he went out of his way to hit me with a response like, yeah, you just don't you must not know the comics, bro. And I was like, well, and I pointed out references as to this is what they're doing here. And I was like, oh, a black guy with an opinion isn't as valid as your your opinion. I was like, mm. oh, my fandom isn't worth as much as yours. Mm. And it's it's really interesting to see that. And it always ties to people who are very protective of the things that they think resonates and connects with them. And it, it gives them that bias, those blinders. Mm. Yeah. So okay. <sighs> <laughs> I noticed I the exhale. Like, no, there's, there's, there's so much to say. Um, so, and there's fandom, and then there's the invalidation of others and mm-hmm. the othering of <clears throat> the voices and the silencing of BIPOC voices. Mm-hmm. I think in my mind, I, I tend to separate them a lot, right? Um, with sister sci fi, and like it's one of our opening mantras, like we are create, like we're celebrating. Black P- POC, um, BIPOC content, and also we're creating spaces for BIPOC voices, right? Um, because like hosting events that like kind of celebrates and analyzes um, BIPOC content, what <laughs> particularly when we're in person, like we get together, we gather, and like the one non BIPOC person would like have all the questions and all the commentary and related to like the grandmother, which is great, yeah. but not the purpose of like said event. So it had to be like, this is like a BIPOC conversation about BIPOC content and we're here for this. So like, in like in my experience, it's kind of like sometimes when it's like, well, I remember I got this one email, like, yeah, you know, I'm a huge fan of Octavia Butler. I met her in like 19, and like, she told me this and like, I wonder why you're doing so-and-so. And I'm like, have you even been to my website? <laughs> <laughs> the words are there. <laughs> I mean, right. like, like, it's, it's pretty clear. It's, it's pretty clear. 
it's it's a thing and <laughs> you, you know like you, you know again like when people I, I make it a point sometimes when i'm like yo have you checked this stuff out it's like you know especially what i'm doing like you know outside of the 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 fandom component or what have you just as a person it's like i am a black person first so a lot of the things that are coming through that prism, it's not like I like it because it's black. It's like I am a black person that like this. So I might like it for a different reason than you do. So and, and we can go down layer to layer to layer. Right. But I remember when, you know, different things were happening as far as social unrest and just the the more prevalent and out there social unrest. I had people for the first time ever hit me in the DMs. Why are you so political? I was like, because I'm a black man and I'm an endangered species. And that's why. And, and I was like, so I like stories like this. And it's um, it's one person I should probably connect you with. I think you'll be a huge fan of. Okay. It's um, it's a um, artist named um, Kumasi Barnett. And what he does is he takes like old comic covers and he changes them to have a social justice slant to it. So instead oh, of so instead of the uh, amazing black man, I mean, instead of amazing Spider Man, the amazing black man, and it's it's gold. It's gold. Yeah, for it, I'm I'm like googling it now. So that sounds amazing, and uh, hopefully they have. Yeah, oh, I see the amazing black man. I'm here for it. Um, instead of yeah. daredevil, it's white devil. It's just pure gold. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like look. <laughs> And and, and, that's, and I, I interviewed him and we were kind of talking about that of like, you know, having that shift because we 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 do this thing. And again, going back to like time. Right. We we do this thing where we want to forget the history of some of these things. And it's like, you know, back in the 50s, the golden era, of some of these things is not great. Right. And we, you know, as far as our content being out there and available to the way that it is now, because we care about black creators, wink, wink, hint, hint. We weren't around then. So we don't even have, it's like ours is just, ours has other things in it. Ours has sexism in it. Our ha ours has um, like sexism. We have uh, homophobia and things of that nature. But ultimately, if people are done doing things in a well-intentioned manner and they're being done, I guess, right and inclusive, we're not doing the same thing that y'all did. Right. Right. And it, and it shouldn't be expected to be done the same. Right. And it shouldn't be. Um, I think sometimes it's difficult. It's like when people are in the space and it's like, you know, this, this content was not created for you in mind. And that is okay. Right. Yeah. Um, I think, I think it was like Barry Jenkins in like discussing, um, the Underground Railroad, the Amazon TV series, yeah. like began using, I don't know if he like coined the term, but like used the term, the black gaze mm -hmm. in an article. And I was like, that's powerful because I think we're so much, so used to saying like, you know, the white gaze, or this is not for the white gaze, but what does it mean to say like, this is for the black gaze or like the female gaze or whatever, like yeah. to really change who, like who this is made for. Right. Mm hmm I think there's attempts to do that too. Like when, when I see something get made, it's like, it's almost like I want to do the, um, Issa Rae thing. It's like, I'm, super, I'm rooting for everybody that's black. That's, that's kind of the energy. And while acknowledging, like I can acknowledge the quality, the well doneness of something while it not necessarily being something that I can relate to in the same way. And I, I think, and we will leave this and move to another topic. Cause I can talk about this forever. Like, Hey man, pop code and all this. But, um, I just remember explaining to white folk going back to Barry Jenkins, like, yeah, so this scene that was in Moonlight, right? And I was like, oh, am I explaining this? And am I the am I the representative right now? And I was like, look, it's hard being black. Moving on, you know, <laughs> like just, I was like, and we do well while it's being hard. So moving on. Right. Um, can you share some of the some of your recent influences, maybe specific works in visual art, literature, film, music, really things that like, yeah, that's, I like, I like what I'm doing as a result of this. Like, I'm really like, sometimes I'll hear a podcast. I was like, this is why I'm doing it. Or I'll watch a movie. And I was like, man, I can't wait to review this movie. Is there something that really just is like, this is yummy creatively. I mean, like, again, I'm a professional fan girl. So like, there's so <laughs> much, um, I really enjoy Fire Sector. Um, it's a graphic novel 
by N.K. Jemison. It's great for fans of Green Lantern, but it's also great for fans of N.K. Jemison. The artwork is by Jamal Campbell. Um, he also did the artwork for Naomi. Um, and yeah, I mean, like you have like N.K. Jemison's incredible like world building and character development and you get into the psychology of it. Um, and then you have Jamal Campbell's like amazing <laughs> artwork. Um, and I was just like, yes, I'm just here for like, these images, right? And it's kind of like fascinating to me because like reading graphic novels is something I do because like I have a bookstore focused on science fiction and fantasy and like the people in the community are like, you are not going to be like with us and not be graphic novels. So I was like, okay. So yeah, so there's, there's that. Um, so that's been really um, amazing and something I really enjoyed. Um, I, I still, I'm going to show you this book because it's been out forever. And I keep talking about it. So in Kindness of Ghost, um, we have special signed editions in hardcover because it was printed like straight um, to paperback because I think it was the author's like first published book. Um, and I just love the character and I love River Solomon and I love the publisher. So that um, like works like that always make me really happy. Um, so that's books in terms of film. Oh my God. I haven't watched um, in terms of like media and like television and stuff like that. I'm, I'm like a, I'm not a big Trekkie, but I love like Star Trek. I'm just to be honest. I love Star Trek discovery. And I'm so happy that she's finally a captain. I was like, I've been waiting. Like, I think it's like season four or five. I was like, uh-huh. I've been on this ride. So I'm happy <laughs> she's finally a captain. And then in terms of, oh, in terms of music, I mean, like there's like the standard answer, like Janelle Monet, but I'm really here for little Oz Axe's last couple of videos, which are very like Afrofuturistic and out mm-hmm. there. Um, and just a lot like him allowing himself to be the fullest expression of himself. So yeah. Um, shows that I'm excited about <laughs> that are down the pipeline. Um, I cannot wait for the movie adaptations um, movie television adaptations of Butler's work. I just want to see how they're created. And I mean, I think a lot of fans are really scared, but I think if you're scared about something, that means you're pushing the envelope. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited about, um, Nomi, Naomi coming to CW, which will yeah. be helmed by Ava DuVernay. I think that'll be awesome. I just hope. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, cause this is being recorded. I think that'd be awesome. And, uh, <laughs> It's like, and yeah, think, cut all of that out, Rob. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Phoenix Song Echo is coming to like Disney Plus, which follows like a differently abled Native American superhero. Yeah. And I love Phoenix. And I was like, and she's going to be Native American and differently abled. It's so, like, I'm here for that. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as they say, um, and, I, and I say this in a real way, representation matters because, you know, you mm, like, but I and I mean, I, one of the things I always say when when people are making attempts, I was like, don't do it for the diversity cloud. If we're going to do it, do it all the way. That's that's the thing that I like to see. I was like, I want to see the the fat guy in a movie that's the hero and that gets the girl or gets the guy or whatever. Not that's comedy relief and vice versa. You know, I want to see, you know, not something that just feels like like the most recent Chucky, right? The uh, Child's Play. I was like, okay, cool. I was like, eh, I was like, yellow young. All right, then. Cool. I was like, I don't. I was fourteen at one point. I don't. I don't know if I was doing any of this. All right, then. Y'all got it. And you know, let it live, and then and then watch it. And then some people who are in that that fandom space is like, uh, you're doing too much. It's like it's the the story is a, a gay dude did this, so I'm sure some of him, some of his DNA in what this is. So let it live. I was like, this is the, the the guy has always been. I was like, Chucky is a very campy character. Let's be real, guys. <laughs> I was like, do you know what you're watching? You know, that's what I, I, that's what I say sometimes. Um, so this is the question. I'm glad we're getting to it now. And I think this is going to be a big shout out to Kamari, my girlfriend. Uh, so there's a belief that black women do not like horror, sci-fi or fantasy genres. I find that to be an outdated idea. And those genres are usually dominated by, by white males, if we're, if we're being honest, and historically speaking. Um, what are your thoughts on the relationship be- with black women consuming and creating in these genres? Right. So when I saw that question, I was like, I think it made me laugh and like laugh out loud. I was like, who thinks this? Um, and then I was like, this is this is the, the blessing of being in a very insulated bubble. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. 
I, it is weird because I never questioned, like I always grew up being like a black woman who like loved science fiction yeah. um, and enjoyed horror. Right. And I think I never questioned it. Like, Oh, do like, am I supposed to do other black women like this? Um, and we do. Right. And I think the reason why that myth kind of like stays around is because when you look at media, right, where you have black women that make it to popular culture, like get a lot of like of the attention of popular culture, like that sci-fi element or that horror element may not be first and foremost. Yeah. Right. So if you think of like, oh, like what's what's a book like the by a black woman right now in the New York Times bestseller list is like the vanishing half, right? Um but you also have like my sister is serial killer, right? <laughs> Which is bothering the genre of my horror, right? And so it's good to see like there are very different ways that we can be black now and they're all yeah. celebrated. Um, so yeah. So I would like to like officially say on record that that is dead. Like there are a lot of black women who really get with horror, science fiction, and all the other anime, yeah. manga. Like all the things. <laughs> I mean, there's a convention. There are more women that goes to blurred con than like dudes. And I'm like, look, uh, <laughs> cause uh, like I didn't get the subscription to shutter. She did. And she's like, yes, yeah, so we watching this. I was like, this is a little, a little strong for, for my taste. <laughs> I was like, I'm the <laughs> Tannery dude who's like a horror writer and did the documentary. Um, I think it's horror noir, a yeah. century of black horror. Yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah, black women are in this. And if you look at the people they interview, I would say like it's at least 50 50, if not more women than men that Absolutely. they interview for that documentary. I, I had this running bit about the, I think it was a four hour documentary just about like horror in general. And I was just like, yo, it's a lot of dry white people hair in this. And that's just a running bit. It looks like whenever we see like Greg Nicotero, it's like, your hair is falling out, sir, as you're talking. Like, can you, <laughs> can you get a prop guy to help you out? Can you glue it in? Like, what are we doing? But yeah, and I, I will say, and I don't know if you, have you watched the, when they tried to do the series version of Horror Noir? No, um, I haven't. I need, I know I need to. It's a, dis they did a little bit of a disservice. Um, instead of and, and not giving anything away, obviously, but it, it, instead of it being a mini series, which it probably should have been like four or five episodes, kind of like what Creep Show was, I I think they just did it as like a two hour thing made up of four stories that are not really interconnected. And it's like, look, you have the same name as the documentary, so that's a strike right there because people think it's the same thing, right? And then two, you have these things which sometimes when you when you can see something like horror is comedy sometimes for me, right? So. I was just like, all right, they did this story. You've worked in, they weaved in some elements of like social justice, or if I like to say, like being more aware of the people around you, but you did it as a disservice of like, we got to get all of this out there. So let's just put them all there and we're done. Mm -hmm. And it should have been a, a series, like four or five parts. Cause it easily could have been, it's, it's, I think it's like two and a half hours. So if you got four sections, you can just break that down into like 40 minute chunks or what have you. But um, it's definitely worth your watch. And I want to know what your thoughts are when you watch it. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch it. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. You're, you're going to laugh. You're going to laugh. It's like, and it's definitely when you're watching it, you almost want to point out like, yeah, a black person wrote that. That's definitely something a black person said. <laughs> I'm excited. Um, speaking of which, what did you think of the newest Candyman? <laughs> uh, I think they had a lot of ideas. Um and I like that it was an homage to the past and covering the future. And I like that um, DaCosta, you know, I think she did a really good job visually. Um, and it wasn't as scary because I've rewatched the most recent one. I mean, the, 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 the old one, the first one um, recently for a review since it's coming up on the 30th anniversary. Um, I think they're about even, though, but in different ways. Like, I like them both, but in different ways. But in I think visually this new one looks a lot better than that, mm. than that, that earlier one. And granted, I was six when the first one came out. So it's kind of one of those <laughs> things of, I didn't have that. Hey, I'm an adult watching this for the first time as I, as I have with this most recent one. Um, but I think the most recent one, I have to watch it maybe one or two more times to appreciate it. But that commentary on art 
I really like that, especially for what I'm doing. And it's mm-hmm. just like, huh, okay, cool. And I, I liked Yaya in it. And I really like Coleman Domingo. <laughs> Domingo is so fire. Like, you know, there's some actors that you respect. You're like, oh, I respect their craft. They're so good. Regina King is one of those actors. Yes. Coleman Domingo, I was like, I just need him to send me like a text like, hey, girl, we need to talk. Because I'm just like, he just seems like <laughs> he has all the tea and all the fire. Like, he would always be on 10. Like, yeah. I love him in, like, everything from, like, um, if Bill Street can talk, yeah. I watch all the Fear of the Walking Dead. His character is so nuanced and a bit crazy in this last season. Um, and he he was great in um, Candyman, I think. And I love Yaya, but I think in Candyman, the newest one, I liked his character more. I appreciated the new Candyman. I actually, like, Sister Swipe, I did, like, a whole, like, crash course Candyman so you can know all the fun facts before you watch the new one. That's great. And I was like, oh, the whole multiple Candyman? I was like, oh, this is new. I don't think I was ready for that. Yeah. Um, We're all Candyman. I don't know if spoilers are allowed. So, yeah. I liked the role of the girlfriend and the mom. Yes. Um, so I appreciated that. Um, and yeah, and then the commentary on like black art, black creativity, um, the consumption of black art. Um, and then that, that, that through line of like gentrification and displacement and so forth was very fascinating to me. So, yeah, I, I think like, the, the, they were just a few things that were ideas that were left hanging. And I thought, um, especially stuff with like the, um, the girlfriend's brother and his, um, partner, that stuff was kind of like left hanging a little bit. Um, and I think, uh, even with the depiction of, I'm trying to think who it was, whoever jumped, um, when they were in the projects and it's like someone jumped, it's like, how is this framed or, I was expecting almost a payoff when they were, when the um, girlfriend was talking about her dad and her brother was talking about their dad. I was like, can we get some payoff here? And it, to me, it felt like either there was a fair amount of cutting for, to, to hit a certain timeline that like we need to be at 90 minutes, a hundred minutes or whatever. But I think either you drop that, but again, some of the elements of the things that felt black in it, namely like, the mom, she's not improved as an actor at all in, in 30 years. Like it's not, not my favorite. Um, but that was a, that, some of it was an act. It's like, mm-mm, we don't talk about that. Mm-mm. Right. Or even the, um, the girlfriend was like, nah, I ain't going down there. Nah. <laughs> I was like, okay. Oh. <laughs> we, it was like, it was a hard note. Like, nope, we are not, we are not doing that today. I was like, yes, that is correct. But, um, <laughs> but the, the big payoff and I, I just wish it was a, like when I saw it, I saw, I think it was at a uh, debut as a special screening. And I wish there was that, that element of theaters were normal, right? Like not COVID it out because when you get towards the end in the police segment, I was like, oh yeah, this is going to be lit. Y'all not getting out of this. Bye. Enjoy. <laughs> enjoy the bees or whatever. Right. I definitely, I definitely appreciate it that scene um and also like just the groundedness to like use that 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 method that magic of Candyman as a weapon in that situation where like you know Candyman is scary but like police brutality is far scarier so like yeah (laughs) so yeah yeah, um, definitely. It's, it's going to be a rewatch because I, I don't think I, further, I, I completely absorbed it. But I remember thinking it was different, but enjoyable. Uh, yes. So I got a few more questions before because I just threw these in there. You don't have these. These are rapid fire questions. I'll hit you with in a, in a few minutes. Okay. But so these are the last two real questions I have. But then I'm going to get into cartoon questions. Uh, do do you have a, a network of other artists or, or writers that you rely on? And in what ways do you support each other, that community of, of people? Because uh, I would imagine there is a community, a sisterhood, as, as one might might say. But tell me um, a little bit more about how, how you all work together. Yeah, we're a community of sister sci-fi siblings to be more gender expansive. Sure. Um, yeah, and I would say it's a mix of both like online and virtual and then in person so like in terms of the community like i'm personally very active in our social media and so i appreciate all of that um and i don't know if they're like all creatives but they're all um really fascinated by the genre of science fiction and fantasy 
and that and that intersection of like black and Native American representation. And some are authors, right? <clears throat> so like um I'm part of like the street team for um JL's um Ashes of Gold, which comes out um next year. And so that's been fun. Um John Jennings is great. John Jennings is like an artist, um a professor, um a movement maker. And like, I'm like, whatever is going on, I'm here for it. Um, it can be like more scholarly um, academics, right? So like there's Ayanna Jameson. And for all of these people, like the nexus is actually like social media and like Facebook and Instagram, which was, you know, I probably spent too much time on Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> um, and then in person, like it's really been gravitating around like cultural institutions that kind of like get me. So like sister sci-fi is based out of a co-working space. So Oak Stop has been, and it's really like a co-working space that was built from the ground up by a black creative. And so he created a co-working space that like have black um, and um, creatives first and foremost. And then like in person, like Mopop in Seattle has been a great co collaborator. And then the Oakland, California, the Oakland Museum of California has also been a strong collaborator. <laughs> and then in terms of like putting me in contact with people who I connect with here. Um, and then also there've been folks like Sister Sci-Fi siblings who've like started to organize events. So like one woman like organized like the Sister Sci-Fi watch parties um, a lot last year and so forth. So it's a broad network in terms of the creativity space. No, I, I like it. I, I, I think that it, it it allows for a different perspective. It it allows for more more discourse, I guess, if that's the the terminology or what have you. And it allows for that message to get spread. And it's like, oh, everyone is everyone's welcome. Like, um, I don't know if you've been to it or if you've heard about. Have you heard of BlurredCon? Yes. Make your way over to the East Coast. Of <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, one of the things that's, that's really big there is inclusivity, inclusivity, inclusivity. And I just feel like you should have a table there. You got to I'm going to I'm going to connect you with, with, with the founder. And it's like, look, ISIS need to have a table. A good one. <laughs> that sounds good. I mean, I'll be in Baltimore. I mean, I think it'll be in February. But um, yeah, let's connect. I mean, like, and now you're officially a part of my network. So yeah, let's let's connect. Yay! I'm here for it. Um, I'm here for it. <laughs> so I got, I got I got one more question um, of the real questions, and this this is one that I I think you you've kind of touched on, but I like to get people's feedback because I think, especially w when I speak with someone that's a creator or creator adjacent or organizer in that space, what does generosity do you mean? And in what ways do you feel like what your work is? How do you emulate that? And how would one pay it forward, I guess? Because that's mm -hmm. a big thing. Like, you know, it's mm -hmm. like catch one, catch all, that that kind of thing. It's like, oh, you got me? Well, you, you got Baltimore now because I represent all of Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, one of our one of our our sister sci-fi's principles is the principle of Ujima. So that that's how I guess I think about generosity, right? So it's how as a black business, am I creating a ripple effect economically within the black and um, <clears throat> community? So it's everything from like, um, as much as possible, like all my, um, all my consultants. So like, my CFO, my graphic, um, my social media manager, my graphic designer, like they're all also black women business owners, right? Because like if we don't support ourselves, who else is going to support us, right? right? Um, and then also like they get it, right? Um, so that's a part of what I'm, I'm doing. Um, obviously, I'm focusing on um, black women writers in this space, not exclusive to, but that's my focus, Black and Native American writers in the space. Um, but also what I'm trying to do is particularly as I head into 2022 is like, how do I create opportunities in a meaningful way for self-published authors? I, I thought it'd be much easier than it actually is. <laughs> it is not. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I'm really trying to find a systematic way to create opportunities for like self-published authors, because I think sometimes it's hard. It's hard for a bookstore to create space for those. And I don't want to just like, oh, it's hard and not do anything because I really feel like there's a need. 
Um, and just really thinking about like, how do I create a virtuous cycle? Like as I grow, that also means that there's a growth for like um, everybody else in the community, right? So like, how do I like, as I drive visibility to the books that I'm also driving visibility to the booktubers who talk about the books and like the bookstagrammers and like the people who review the books who like may um, may be doing it from a place of just like passion and joy, but also making sure that their work is seen and is valued. So that's kind of like how I think about generosity, like in the term of Ujima. I appreciate that. And a, there is a a local kind of like black led nonprofit that's here that they definitely have the Kwanzaa oriented, like philosophy as part of what they're doing. And it's through, it's like, yeah, you know, this was the first few years, but now we definitely want to have those principles incorporated. And, um, recently, and it was not news. And I interviewed, um, I interviewed the founder for, uh, for giving Tuesday, we were kind of talking about it. And he was like, huh, hmm. He's like, we had a Baltimore Raven make the biggest $200,000 donation to their organization. And that's one of the biggest donations to, if not the biggest, to a black led, black founded, like, um, nonprofit. And nobody really talked about it. Mm-hmm. And it was really interesting. And he's like, our principles are rooted. You know, he said, definitely we're being more vocal and more demonstrative about our, um, mission being oriented around like Ujima and all of these different things, especially connected to blackness. Right. And, um, he's like, yeah, I feel like, you know, just just funny how that wasn't even covered. Not news for some reason. Right, right. But uh, it, it's it's big or what have you. And, you know, it's just a found, I think, for like resources. So I always want to like find out like what are what are organizations doing? Because it's it's important. It's important for us to really be able to to help ourselves. And because we, we, we make up the culture, we drive the coolest stuff. And if we're able to help each other, that's where the real the real magic happens, I think. Right. Agree. All right. Here's here's my ridiculous questions. I got three of them. Um, <laughs> uh, two of them are, are short. All, all of these are intended to be short answers, like really matter of fact. Like, look, I said what I said, what you said was some uh, it, it's aimed to be that. Um, but the last one might be a little longer. All right. First one. Music, audio books or podcasts. What, what is your preference between those three? <sighs> And if you, if you, whatever your preference is, give me an example of what you recently been into. Music. Um, so yeah. So Spotify, like I love Spotify. I'm like, if there's an app that I could marry, it would be Spotify. Um, (laughs) like I've been saying this for like a long time. That's an episode of black um, mirror, by the way. uh, (laughs) It's like, like, yeah, I married Spotify. I was like, Isis, what, is you this? Sure? Yeah. what is your 2021 rap? Like, what is this? <laughs> right. And I was, I was about to talk about that. I love like, and then I thought that my 2021 rap, which was like, I'm like, oh, look at me growing. Look at how my music takes have changed. So like, there was a lot of Afro beat in there. I discovered with, like, I got into like WizKid a lot. And so, yeah, I'm like, that's what, that's why I love Spotify. Cause Spotify knows me like, yeah. yeah. Well, low too um, well, but, actually sometimes. What? A little too well sometimes. I got my podcast wrapped and I was like, yeah, people listen to you all the time. I was like, oh no, my real secret's in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And so, yeah. So, of the three, it would be music. And sometimes, yeah. 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 It's probably, it's probably actually all three for me. I've really gotten into audiobooks recently because uh, uh, I was having a conversation um, with, because you get into this spot where, I'm not the biggest reader, but the way that I consume books is, is audio books or what have you. That works for me because I, I can't quiet my mind the way that I would like to be able to sit there and just focus. It's like, it's hard for me. So, um, but the way that I'll consume it, I'll listen to an audio book like five, six, seven times. And it's like, yeah, I know everything in here. Boom. You whereas, do. <laughs> whereas if I, if I um, like read it, I'm not retaining it the way that I would like. So it can be a little frustrating at times. So right now I've been listening to um, Shannon Lee's like ebook about Bruce Lee and it's called Be Water, My Friend. And it's just like talking about positive affirmation and, and kind of things of that nature. And I'm like, yeah, Bruce Lee was right. This is great. <laughs> yeah. And the one thing I would say is that listening to an audiobook is a reading. So well, you are you. reading um, as a fellow audiobook listener and i was really like oh, i have to choose one i love audiobooks i've loved audiobooks for a long time um so yeah i'm about to like <laughs> um 
are you a night owl or early riser or early bird to go with the whole bird analogy nonsense? Because uh, I'm a writer. Um, naturally, I'm a night owl. Um, and then uh, about two months ago, I started doing 4 a.m. meditation. So mm. now I'm an early bird. Well, we'll isn't see that how something? this goes. Huh? Yeah, isn't that something? Isn't it funny how that shift happens? Uh huh. I used to like I have insomnia on occasion, so uh, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'm just like, look, if I'm not going, not, if I'm not back to sleep in the next ten minutes, I'm just going to go to the computer and do some work, and um, and I'll fall asleep at like ten o'clock now because I'm I'm washed yeah. at thirty six. I'm done. It's over. Right. I'll just, right. <laughs> I'll just say I'm done. I'm washed up. You know, I'm knackered, <laughs> cheese and crackers. Uh, now, this is the last one I have for you. Um, and I have my feelings about this series and it got canceled, what I, which I think was premature. Um, but I'll, I'll, a speculative fiction sort of way. If Lovecraft Country got a second season, what maybe historical event would you want to see covered in it? Because they, they, they covered, um, I think in the first season, they covered um, Emmett Till. They covered Black Wall Street in some ways. Um, so some of those things that we know to be real life things and they kind of expanded upon that in season two if they were to do one which they got canceled by hbo but hey they can pop up somewhere else in a different format what would you want to see covered oh my what God, major event person. yeah um one <clears throat> love love cross country um i was here for i mean there were some parts that were wrong around, but i loved it um I think Misha Green is gonna take it somewhere. So um, I think I saw a post that she was uh, in conversation with, I think it was like maybe Apple or something like that. I heard that so, too, yeah. Sending positive vibrations that way. Um, and also now I'm procrastinating because I'm like, oh, what history is like my worst subject. Um, second worst subject after it's, the only thing worse than history is probably accounting for me. Um, <laughs> Same. Yeah. Right? It's like, oh, what, what is this number here? What? Right. Why, why like, are those uh, numbers red? Oh, right. I'm losing oh. money. Got it. Uh, <laughs> so, um, historical events. Um, I'm trying to, like, in that time zone. And they covered so much in Lovecraft Country. Like, they covered, like, the first black woman in a motorcycle across the country. They like, did, yeah. They cover like artwork. Um, uh, through so maybe one thing I didn't see was kind of like uh, I don't know if this is you know I don't have a good answer because I'm like I would just be pulling stuff that like comes to mind and not necessarily something that um, I really want a good answer to this. And well, but here, here's one of the things I think to consider, which could help you with this block, maybe uh, I because I, I, I think the way that the question is framed, it, it kind of leads you to a block. I think the way that they left off, they could do almost anything with that second season. Right. Yeah. Theoretically. So they could maybe focus on the, the daughter and kind of do a time jump because there, there are some things like, for instance, Michael K. Williams passed away. So that is that situation is gone. So we could jump literally 20 years and we could be in the 80s. And you can have right. a litany of historical things in the eighties. You can do, what is it? Um, the move coalition, you can do a litany of different things. You can have like, yeah, man, it was a bunch of like uh, predators in the subways in, in New York. See, it's full circle, full circle, New Yorker. <laughs> yeah. And so this is, I mean, like, I, cause I was like, you can go really way back and like do Buffalo soldiers. And I was like, is that something I'm really excited about? Or is it just because like the harder they, the harder they fall is on my mind. <laughs> I don't know. Um, like you could do like the migration of like, well, they kind of talked about it. And also I was like, oh, I started thinking about stuff. Like you already did that. Like the migration of like um, Southern blacks to like cities like Chicago and New York, but they kind of talk about that. I mm -hmm. love Croft country. Um, then I was like, would it be cool to incorporate like the black Panther movement and like something like Lovecraft country? That would be cool. Um, so be yeah. So what would, I mean, what would make lots of sense with like, especially if we're talking about D and the daughter and then like the, um, the development of Hippolytus. Okay. So I just needed to talk about Boom, this. See, about. see, <laughs> so, yeah, and the, the development of, um, Hippolytus character, um, like incorporating hidden figures, right? Because that's not something that was necessarily, it, it speaks to like what Dee's about in the Hippolyta story. And like she being like a woman who's um, throughout the episode was very vocal about her passion about um, STEM. So yeah. that's that's what I would like to see. 
um, and kind of taking the whole real history of that, of the hidden figures um, and their work with NASA and then adding like a sci-fi fantasy element to it. Yeah. Like I, I like that kind of, you know, this story, quote unquote, it, is, it has that element of like speculative fiction with it, almost like with some of the things that I like the most of, especially with the more recent one, especially you, you mentioned Regina, but with, with the uh, Watchmen or what have you, it's like, yeah, we have this in there, but this is really what happened and putting it in within their universe. I, that's the, what is most successful about that franchise, the, the um, Zack Snyder movie and the series. That's what's most effective about that. It's like, yeah, you know this story. We've shown you a thousand times, but did you know this covert superhero blicked right. him off, like shot Kennedy or what have you? Like, oh, word. So I, I like when people, when, when, when uh, content tends to do that. So having that in there, it's like, yeah, you know, well, actually, she was one of the, Hippolyta was one of the, the three women that were involved in Hidden Figures. And right, right. And if you can, this is what will be the most effective way. They they wouldn't do it because they wouldn't give me the thing that I want. But just have Janelle just pop up in there. She reprises her character from it. And it's like, yeah, I was working with her. It's right. like, boom, here you go. We're just crossing universes. Oh, yes. So that's all that I have. But I want to invite you. One, I want to thank you for being on this podcast. You were great. And two, I want to invite you to tell the fine folks where they can find you and more about uh, Sister uh, Sci-Fi. Thank you so much. Um, you can visit us on our website, www.sistersci-fi.com, and that's sister, S-I-S-T-A-H, in case you're wondering. Um, and sci-fi is S-C-I-F-I, and then .com. And then you can also follow us on all the socials, so Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, whatever strikes your fantasy, um, at Sister Sci-Fi. So there you have it, folks. I want to thank you again, Isis Asari, for being on this podcast. And um, I'll wrap up from there. So uh, Isis Asari from Sista Sci-Fi. And I'm Rob Lee saying that there is art in and around your city. You just got to look for it.